been looking uh, for a long time to someone to accurately introduce me uh, as an Irishman from Rhode Island. Thank you, Henrietta, for that. <laughs> that is, uh, that's, uh, those, are, those are true words. Uh, and thank you for your, for your kind words. But even more, thank you for your leadership in, in government and in business uh, and at the Asia Society. Uh, I'm honored to receive this recognition tonight, uh, and honored to be joining such an impressive list of past recipients. And it's especially meaningful that this award comes from an organization uh, dedicated to deepening connections between the peoples and cultures of Asia and the United States. I also want to congratulate my fellow honorees this evening. I worked closely with Minister Zhang during his time as ambassador to the United States, and he played an extraordinary role in bolstering the relationship between the United States and China. But I also want to say a word about Ambassador Sui who, despite his protestations, of course, is one of Beijing's premier diplomats. Uh, and he and I have spent many hours together over the years, most recently planning and participating in the important and successful summit this past, uh, this past weekend between President Obama and President Xi. Uh, Ambassador Sui's work has been essential uh, uh, in terms of relations between the United States and China, and his, uh, his uh, skills were on display this weekend at, uh, at Sunny Lands, which was really a, a unique uh, and historic summit. And, I want to thank you, my friend, for all the work you've done. Uh, I also like to thank Arnie Sorensen for his work at Marriott uh, and all the work that Marriott is doing to lead our business community's engagement in the, in the Asian Pacific. And your point about this being more than government to government work uh, is absolutely correct and essential. And of course, that's the core of what the Asian society, what the Asian society does. And tonight we're also celebrating just that, uh, Sharon's debut uh, as the new president of the Asian Society. Sharon, uh, uh, just that, as you know, has a terrific record of service and leadership and, importantly, making a difference. Uh, and the Asian Society is truly fortunate to have you at the helm, uh, just that. <laughs> now, uh, we're all here tonight because we understand that the future of Asia and the future of the United States are deeply and increasingly linked. When we look at where America's priorities lie, and will lie in the years to come, it's clear that nowhere in the world are there more critical opportunities to advance our economic interests, our security interests, and our enduring interest in promoting universal human values than in the Asia Pacific. In short, America's success in the 21st century is tied to Asia's success. Our fortunes will rise and fall together as our businesses and our banks, our universities and our scientists, our innovators and developers form more and more in-depth partnerships. Sustained American engagement in Asia is vital now more than ever. Asia already accounts for more than one quarter of global GDP, and over the next five years, nearly half of all the growth that doesn't come from within the United States is expected to come from Asia. As many as 2.4 million American jobs are supported by U.S. exports to Asia, and that number is only going to grow. So it's clear that sustained, robust U.S. trade and investment in Asia is good for everyone. And it will be critical of, of both for our long-term economic recovery and ensuring a long-term economic growth. This explosive economic power is also fueling potent political forces that are both reshaping the region and drawing the global center of gravity towards Asia. Just think about China's ascent, Japan's resilience, the rise of a global Korea, India's look east policy, and the nations of Southeast Asia are becoming more and more prosperous and interconnected by the day. The decisions of people of the region and their leaders make today during this period of rapid change and transition these choices will shape the rules that govern the Asia Pacific's economic and geopolitical progress for decades to come. And as a Pacific power, the United States has a key leadership role to play in these uh, discussions. Now, the United States has deep investments and historic ties to the Asia Pacific. But when we came to office in 2009, uh, the administration came to the belief that America's presence didn't match the region's growing influence and economic dynamism. A decade defined by terrorist threats and wars in Iraq and Afghanistan had heavily weighted our engagement in the world uh, towards our military efforts in the Middle East and left us underweighted in, Asia, in the Asia Pacific. And our strategic rebalancing was born from that understanding. This was the core insight that we came to during the transition and at the outset of the administration. Now, as the President explained in his address to the Australian Parliament in Canberra, the overarching objective of the United States and the region is to sustain a stable security environment and a regional order rooted in economic openness, peaceful resolution of disputes, and respect for universal human rights and freedoms. It's for this reason, for these reasons, that from day one, the Obama administration set out to engage the Asia Pacific with every element of our national power. 
Now, to pursue this vision, the United States is implementing a comprehensive, multidimensional strategy, strengthening alliances, deepening partnerships with emerging powers, critically building a stable, productive, and constructive relationship with China, on which we made great progress last weekend, empowering regional institutions, and helping to build a regional economic architecture that can sustain shared prosperity. Across the board, President Obama has placed a premium on high-level engagement in Asia. He made the decision personally to participate in APEC and the East Asia Summit. He's met each year of his presidency with the leaders of ASEAN and will do so every year left in his presidency. He's met with every, nearly every leader in Southeast Asia individually, and he has hosted the leaders of the Pacific, Isle, the Pacific Islands. He met with former Chinese President Hu Jintao 12 times. Uh, la and last week in California, as we discussed, met with President Xi to begin building a new strong working relationship with China's new leader. With these steps, I'm convinced that the United States is now in a stronger position to seize the opportunities of the Asia Pacific and secure the safety and prosperity of the American people. But we have to sustain the momentum that we built across each pillar of our strategic investment. And for all the change taking place, let me review those pillars for you. For all the change taking place across the region, this much is, will remain the same. We will continue strengthening our historic alliances with Japan, Korea, Thailand, Australia, and the Philippines. This is the first policy, first pillar of our policy in Asia. We work diligently to make sure our alliances in Asia are stronger than they have ever been, and that they remain the foundation of the region's security and prosperity. With our alliances healthy and strong, we can continue working on our second pillar, forging deeper partnerships with the emerging powers such as India and Indonesia. These maturing democracies are natural partners for the United States. We share many of the same values and interests, and we welcome their growing engagement across the region and on the global stage. And of course, building a productive and constructive relationship with China is the next essential element, next essential pillar of our engagement in Asia. Here's the simple truth. Few diplomatic, economic, or security challenges in the world can be addressed without both China and the United States at the table working together. We have no illusions, as Ambassador Sway discussed, that there are challenges in the relationship. There are bound to be in a relationship of this complexity and of this scale. But the leaders on both sides of the Pacific agree that conflict is by no means inevitable. And Ronnie, the point you were making has been a, uh, with respect to the theoreticians and the international relations uh, theorists who come to the table and, and argue that conflict is inevitable, that there's, uh, his history would dictate uh, that there be conflict between an existing power and a rising power. This proposition is rejected by both the leadership and, 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 uh, and, and leadership in both countries. And it really underpins the discussion we've had about building a new model of relationships between great powers. This past weekend, as we discussed, uh, President Obama and President Xi met in California. It was an unprecedented event in the annals of U.S.-China relations. The encounter was notable for a number of its unique attributes, its informal style and setting, the breadth and depth of the discussions between the leaders, the strategic nature of the discussion between the leaders, the timing of the encounter at the very outset, the outset of President Obama's second term, and at the very beginning of President Xi's tenure as President of China, which we expect to go be it for a decade. It's our hope coming away from last week and that we built the basis uh, for bringing the U.S.-China relationship uh, to the next level. And I have every confidence that we've done so. Now, we'll continue to work to strengthen Asia's regional institution, our fourth pillar of our strategy. To address complex 21st century challenges, Asia needs an architecture supported by shared rules and norms that encourages cooperation, maintains stability, and helps resolve disputes peacefully. That's why we've engaged so intensely in APEC and ASEAN and the East Asia Summit. Finally, uh, we will keep building an economic order that is open and transparent where trade and investment are free, fair, and environmentally sustainable, and where all the people of the Asia Pacific, including Americans, can benefit from the greater trade and growth in that region. That's why we're working so hard this year to realize the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP, in which 11 countries represent an annual trading relationship of $1.4 trillion, about one-third of all world trade. The TPP is an absolute statement of U.S. strategic commitment to Asia for the long haul. It is the most important negotiating, trade negotiation underway in the world today. And the economic norms that will govern Asia will influence the economic norms for the entire world. And we're going to work together to get this right. Now, that's a long and challenging agenda, but it's 100 percent achievable. Just, tell, look, uh, just look at how far this region has come in the past few decades. Credit for, it, for the Asia Pacific's extraordinary progress belongs first and foremost to the, to the region's hardworking and talented people. But U.S. engagement has been critical in helping shape 
Asia's path forward. And I ask you as I close tonight to engage in a bit of a thought experiment with me. Think for a moment how things would look if the United States had been absent from the region for the past 70 years. And I think it's safe to say, and others would agree, that Asia would be very different today. Without the U.S. underwriting security and stability in Asia, without the U.S. Navy ensuring the free flow of commerce through sea lanes in the Pacific, without our public and private calls to protect core human rights, would we be better off or worse? Would peace have remained, replaced militarism and conflict? Would commerce have thrived? Would South Korea have risen from aid or an aid recipient to a trading powerhouse? I think the answer is clear. Now we again have the opportunity to be Asia's primary partner and, to get, and together chart a future of progress and prosperity in the 21st century, and we intend to seize that. We've laid a strong foundation. Thank you. We've laid a strong foundation of engagement in President Obama's first term, and I know this will continue to be a policy priority in the second term. And there's a role for all of you to play in this. Asia is home to more than half the world's population and growing every day. Government policies will only take us so far. To reach into people's daily lives and make America's relationship in the region personal and real, we need the support of our citizens. As Mr. Sway was saying, it's absolutely critical to develop the support of the peoples of the region, both, both the United States and the region. And so I encourage you to keep building the connections of culture and exchange and business between our peoples as the Asia Society has done for so many years. So thanks again for uh, this award, for your unflagging commitment to promote cross-cultural understanding. And I'm confident that our engagement and partnerships in Asia will remain a priority for the United States for many years to come. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate it.